I am embarrassingly tired right now. I get to grow. This is getting, I guess, 30 years doing something weird on you. And as many of you guys know, I had to take my baby boy up to Columbus, Ohio, and drop him off uh, to school. So we're empty nesters. Uh, so it's been a lot. It's been a busy, uh, busy couple weeks for us. So anyway. All right. Um, so welcome. We have some familiar faces in here. We have some new faces in here. The hardest part of this is that it's, it's um, you know, finding that happy medium when we sit in here and talk about, you know, there's some people that know why is it about volleyball that want to learn something new, and then there's people that uh, know very little that just want to understand the game better. I started doing this a few years back for that purpose. We had people, we had fans that were Western Kentucky fans that came to volleyball matches and said, I love it, but I just wish I knew more about the game and what was going on. And so I decided I was just the guy for the job. And so I decided if, if we want fans to come to our games, then it's important to educate them so they can have an enjoyable experience while they're there and know what's going on and make sure that you're only yelling me at me about appropriate things. And <laughs> it's not just something you don't understand. And so. Uh, so we started doing this during the clinic. I'm not much help out there in the clinic anyway. Uh, some of you guys may be parents of little ones that are out there and you're just starting a volleyball endeavor and you're trying to learn uh, a little bit too. And so um, we'll, we'll just kind of take it from there. I don't know if I have enough of these, but I brought these. These are something you can take with you if you want. I may even use them at some point. There's just a couple of really helpful articles about the game. One, one of the things that always confuses people that don't know much about the game is how players rotate, why they rotate, front row, back row, all those kinds of things. You know, I, one of my favorite questions always was, you know, you got a kid like Paige Briggs last year who was an All-American, and I'll have fans come up to me and say, Coach, I have no idea why you ever make her go to the back row. <laughs> and I say, trust me, I don't want her to go to the back row. But, you know, there's rotational things that make that happen. And so uh, this article, this is a handout. This article is, says the college volleyball rotation explained. And it kind of explains rotating and how it works and uh, all of that kind of stuff. So if you already know that, you don't need one of these. But if you don't, when you leave, grab one of these, and it will help you understand a little bit more if we don't explain it today, a little bit more about how, why you rotate, how you rotate, how you set a line up. How is it strategic to set a lineup and you know spin in your lineup and do different things? And we can talk about some of that. But one of these is the college volleyball rotation explained, and uh, that's a good little article that I read. And then this second one is just says the college volleyball dictionary. It's glossary in, in terms. It's just different terms in our game, uh, and it literally gives you a definition of what they are. And again, might explain a little bit more. Where if you hear me after a match saying. You know that uh, Kaylee Cox's skill percentage needs to be higher. You're like, oh yeah, I agree. What, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, and that's that's kind of what you know. This will answer some of the questions about the vernacular that you hear when you are watching the game on TV, or you may <clears throat> see a particular call by someone during a, an official, or and not understand it. Like, I hate that for our fans. I hate our fans to not know, you know, exactly what's going on uh, with that. So. Um, so the first year this was easy because I started from ground zero and worked my way up. Um, every year after that gets a little harder because again you don't know how many in the room are new to the game, you know somewhat, how many have an understanding of the game. And so what I will do is just hit a couple of things quickly and then um, I will just, we'll just kind of start a conversation and when people have questions, if you know nothing, say hey I know nothing, what is a setter? And we'll talk about setting position and all that kind of stuff. Or if you have something a little more advanced you want to know, or you've been, you know, I see fans sitting here that have been uh, part of our program for more than a decade, and they may have a better understanding. But if there's things you still are curious about, man, let's talk about it. And if you want to talk about our team or talk about specific players you saw, this is your time, okay? The other thing that I want to be very, very clear on is this is your time. And so no matter how short or long this goes, we may all be out of this room in 30 minutes, or we may still be here, I may still be here an hour and a half from now. And whenever it's your time to be done, you've got what you're after, it is not disrespectful in any way for me when you just get up and, 
and let yourself out of the room, okay? Because I don't want to hold anybody hostage in here either. If you have places to be on Saturday, I hope you make those places, but we're, we're glad that you made this part of your day as well. Okay, fair enough, everybody? Yeah. Okay, well, the first thing I want to touch on before I open it up to you guys that everybody needs to know is there's been a couple rule changes. So all you vets that think you know, I'm gonna to try to calm you down a little bit before you go out there and lose your mind on game day seeing something. Uh, but there's two rules that are gonna be very different to our game of volleyball this year, okay? One of those rules is uh, you are now allowed, there it used to be the Libero, for those of you who don't know, the person in the different color jersey it's called a Libro, and that person is an all-time defensive player. Like, they get privileges, they can stay in the game. You know, we can talk more about Libros if you want. But you always designated who your one Libro was, and when you saw a team, they would only have one person in a different color jersey, okay? Uh, they changed that rule, and you're now allowed to dress two Libros, okay? You can only have one of them in the game at a time. So we can't dress two Libros. And like in that third game, I was afraid I might confuse you guys, but you saw Abby and, and uh, Mass and Chitty out there together on the court. That will never happen. You cannot do that. We just did that for a lineup, just looking at lineups and different things and all that. But you can dress two Libros, but only one of them could be on the court at a time. Okay, so you may be like, well, why would you have two Libros? Well, there's a couple of different reasons. Okay, one, the Libro's role, main role, one is to play defense, big balls. The other big role that they have is in serve receive, when the ball's being served and they're passing that initial ball, okay? Some Libro's are way more gifted at one or the other. They may be a great defender, but an average passer, or a great passer and an average defender. And so literally when your team is in serve receive, passing the ball, you could run one of them out there. Okay, and then if you score a point, you're going back to serve, and now you just have to play defense, you can switch them. Okay, and you may see teams doing that some. Okay, running a lead row back and forth, but that is a rule change this year. Another way, and this is where I think we might utilize it a little bit more, okay, is um, you may, your lead row may be an average server. If she's not a good server, you could put another kid in that Libro jersey and let her, because that's another role that the Libro plays, right? They're a server. So you may you may see, you know, most Libros are a little bitty, right? But you may have a six foot five offensive player that's not starting, that's a great server, and you may put her in your other Libro jersey, and when it's time for the Libro to serve, she may just go out there and serve and finish that play and then come out and the other Libro may serve the role the rest of the time, if that makes sense. So that's going to be different. Any guys, is that a question? It, it, does it count as a substitution? It does not. That's the other thing about a Libro. Anytime a Libro comes in out of the game, it doesn't count as when you get 15 substitutions per set in the game of volleyball. When somebody comes in for somebody, they have to go report in. Okay, and you'll see that during the game. The, if anybody else that substitutes in a game, they have to come up to the line and the official has to wave them in for them to enter the game. You'll see Libros just kind of running on and off the court. Like they don't count as substitutions. So any any usage of those Libros doesn't count as any subs. None, okay? So they can go back and forth every play and it doesn't count anything. So that is one of the big rule changes, okay? It is, it's college, it's a college rule for now. You know, usually those things bleed down to other levels and stuff like that, but it is, it is our new rule. That's one of them, <clears throat> okay? And the second one, and this one's a big one, okay, uh, for fans, because fans love, and coaches, because fans and coaches love to yell about double contacts when they settle on a spin and all that kind of stuff. And to be honest, this will make the game easier to follow because it won't be as confusing now about when they're blowing a whistle and when they don't. But they, changed, they got rid of a double contact rule. So it used to be if a setter set a ball and they set it and it's spinning all over the place because they contacted it, then they would blow the whistle and call that a double contact and you lose the point. Okay? And there were all kinds of crazy mad coaches and fans and everybody else because one time it would come out a little funny and they would call it a double. The next time it would come out a little funny and they would let it go. 
and it's hard on fans, and it's hard on coaches, and it's hard on officials, and you know it, it's hard on everybody. So what they chose to do was uh, just eliminate the double contact rule. Now that didn't sit well with volleyball purists because. The art of setting, setting a clean ball, that ball that comes out that's just a novel ball floating out there when Cali's setting it places. Um, like that's part of the beauty of our game, if you will, for people that have been around the game for a long time. And setting that ball with precision and clean, coming out of their hands clean, all that kind of stuff. Um, so at first, it really riled people up, okay? But to be honest, we used it as an experimental rule in our spring season. It really didn't impact the game very much. It might happen a couple times in a set, but now you don't have to worry, you just play on, okay? Now, with one exception, there is an exception to the rule, okay? And this matters. You're still not allowed to double contact the ball and take it over the net, okay? So I can set if Scott right there, I can set him ball, and that thing can be spinning like a top, and it's no big deal. He can hit it, we're playing on now, okay? But if I set it, it's spinning like a top, and it goes over the net, that's still a double contact. And you may ask why. And the reason is so setters can't take the ball and just like throw it over, like dump it over the net, you know, and really kind of just throw the ball places over the net. It, it makes setters, if they're going to dump the ball, because you saw Cali do it a couple times, if they're going to dump the ball where it still has to come out clean like the old rule. So if the ball crosses the net, it's still, it's still a double contact. So if you see it, Katie Howard trying to set a ball across the court and it's spinning like a top, and uh, Kaylee Cox goes up and hits it, we're all good. If she sets a ball across the court and it's spinning like a top and it floats over the net, and the other kid touches it, they're going to blow the whistle and call a double contact because it went across the net. Does that make sense? So those are the two massive rule changes. What if okay. The kid touch Say again. What if the kid doesn't? It's still a double contact. You're still going to get called. Anything that crosses the plane of the net is going to be called a, a double contact. Yep. Does that mean you're going to have to teach the girls to try and get those balls over when they think it's going to go over the net? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to try to touch it, you know, when it's going over the net. But to be honest, it really hasn't impacted training or anything like that. It has in one way. It used to be your setter, you know, handling every ball. And if it was like a dig that was way back off the court, you would always, for the most part, you would see players just take their platform and just bump set the ball way outside. Now you're going to see players that can get to that ball are going to want to put their hands on it because they can control it a little bit more and they don't have to worry about being called for a double contact. You know what I mean? So we've been experimenting with that a little bit in preseason, but you'll see times when you know they'll be a little more risky putting their hands on the ball because they don't have the fear of being called for a double contact anymore. And so, but you'll adapt to that actually pretty quickly, and it actually just makes you not worry about. It takes it out of the officials' judgment, which I promise you officials are happy about too. Because it's just tough. Like, as an official, I have some really good friends that are officials, believe it or not. And, um, and officials, like, sometimes they'll box themselves into a corner. Like, early in the game, they'll see one they don't like and they blow their whistle. And now that's the standard for that game. And now they have to blow it every time. They Like, it's just a lot. And so, overall, I think that's going to be a good rule change. Okay, but just don't lose your mind the first time you see a ball spinning like crazy when it comes out of the setter's hand. Okay, so those are the two big rule changes. Uh, from there, uh, again, if everybody just sits here and stares at me and, but doesn't get up, it means you still want to learn, but you have no idea what to ask. And I, can, I can stumble onto a couple topics that I think are, might be of interest to you, but otherwise, I'm curious what you guys have questions about about the game about our team, about any any of the above. Anything you want to ask, I'm here to, to fill in the gaps. Yes? Are you are we going to have instant replay or? Um, that, like the video review like we had last yeah, year? Yeah. Yes. We, uh, that's still absolutely going to be part of the game. Um, so we'll still have video review. Um, I think. This is embarrassing, but I'm not even 100 percent sure I know what the current rule is. I think it's still two challenges, and you keep them as long as you're right. 
you know, and I think that's that's the proper rule, okay? And, um, you know, but, you know, sometimes the review system, one of the things we've all learned is the review system is only as good as the cameras. There are times when there's a touch, but, like, there's times when the official will come to you when you challenge a call and they don't say, sorry, coach, there was no touch, or, yes, coach, there was a touch. There's times when they'll come to you and say, coach, you couldn't see it. It just wasn't clear enough at, at that angle or whatever the case may be. And so, you know, that's that's still part of this thing to a certain degree too. But yes, we will have we will have the video review. Yes. What's the camera set up here? What's ours? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. There's always usually a net cam. You'll always see one mounted on the side of the net. And that net cam, you know, looking straight across right there is the main one for uh, touching the net because again when you, at no point can either side of the of the net legally touch the net while the ball's in play okay so a lock if they if they press over and clip the net like that a lot of times that net cam will pick that up okay uh, touch calls sometimes it'll pick up that um, and then there's usually four cameras that hit the four sidelines and then you usually have an inline camera as well that'll help with touch calls. I'm very ready for us to uncover the bucket of money it takes to have the Olympic technology. <laughs> where you can just look at it like tennis and see immediately where that, that would be nice. That would be nice, but we're still a ways away from that in college athletics. That's for sure. If, if you challenge and they're unable to does that count as a failed challenge on your part? It does. Yes. That's a good question. If I ever challenge a call and they're, they come back to me and say, sorry, we coach, we couldn't see it, then that means the call on the floor has to stand, which is opposite of what I challenged, and so therefore I would lose the challenge there. That's very frustrating when that happens. But it does. From time to time, it does. Yes? So under the category that needs those papers, Okay. pretty new to all this. Great. Welcome. A resource that you can direct me to that, mm -hmm. because I couldn't even have to formulate the questions to ask you. Mm -hmm. so is there a resource that you can Well, this is a good place to start. Um, in, in terms of just learning the basics of the game, there's a lot of stuff like this that's out there, um, you know, terminology wise and stuff like that. Uh, one of the things, you know, for those of you that haven't been a part of it, Another thing is a little bit off top off your question, but it will help you some too. If you become a fan and you start coming to our games, I do a uh, chalk talk before every home game, okay, where we come right in here and sit, and 30 minutes before the first serve, I will come in here and spend five, 10 minutes with our fans, and I will talk to you guys about uh, scouting report, um, what, how our team is, all those kinds of things leading into the games. I know it may seem a little odd that I do that right before the games, but I would tell you two things. Number one, again, as we've built our fan base through the years, I understand my responsibility to help educate you. And the more connected you feel to what's going on, the more connected you are to our team, and, and that's a good thing. And then the second thing that brings me in here 30 minutes before the game, I hate warm-ups. <laughs> With a passion. I hate warm-ups. I am a, I'm a pretty calm dude day to day. On game day, I'm a mess because my happy place is out there in practice. I love to teach and train and watch light bulbs come on and all that. Game day, I'm completely at the mercy of a bunch of 19-year-olds, and that's no fun for me. Okay, and I sit there and think about everything that I say this all the time, but the head coach. Like, it does no good to sit there and think about everything going right. If everything goes right, everybody's happy. Everything's good. So all day I'm sitting there thinking about everything that could go wrong, and that puts me in a pretty ugly place. And so prior to games, I used to go watch warm-ups. I'd sit out there like most coaches do and watch warm-ups, and I would be so worked up before, the, like our team didn't look like they were warming up well, or the other team would look great, and I'd be a mess before we ever started. And I was like, eh, I'll see you guys at game time. And so I don't even go to the court till six, seven minutes before the match actually begins. And it's better for everybody. Our players love it. If I ever walk through there, they're like, what are you doing out here? 
And, um, and so I enjoy coming in and having that interaction with Fort Gaines. And so you can certainly learn a little bit more, you know, there as well. Um, but just the basics, Morgan, I see you sitting in the back of the room. Do you have any thoughts? Morgan, Coach's Club, for one of the clubs here in the area. When you guys have new people that are trying to learn the game, do you have any thoughts on? on I think YouTube is a great resource. Like, yeah. you can kind of just search volleyball 101 or just different things. And they've got uh, art of coaching, and those two things are great to learn. Yeah, there's, and just little by little, just picking up the basics of it. And like I said, if you're ever around and I'm around, ask questions. Now, there's no, sure, you, yeah, you get them before they're gone, right? <laughs> Take one of each. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Uh, thank you, Not about that. Okay. When's your coaches show starting, and is it at Roosters again this year? Well, they're doing the coaches show a little bit differently this year. It is still going to be at Roosters, but they're trying. Every year they've kind of done a little bit different format to try to find what's best for everybody involved, which is fans, coaches, sponsors, everybody. They're trying to find, you know, a uh, uh, reach, like how can we best reach the most people, all those kinds of things. And so every year they've kind of played with the format a little bit. And this year what they're going to do is do a once a month in person at Roosters and then the other weeks for coaches show they're going to do like a podcast format that you'll be able to uh, access online. And I know you don't like that because you love coming to the coaches show every week and I love seeing you guys there. Um, but it, they'll, be, it'll be announced what days we will be there in person. But then the other weeks will be a podcast format and they're going to see if that maybe reaches even more people. And uh, so they're just continuing to try to find ways to, to do it better and reach more people and, and all of that kind of stuff. But that should, there should be a release. We haven't released it yet or have we, Scott? Yeah, we'll announce it Tuesday, but the first one at Roosters is the 26th at 6 p.m. Yeah, but it'll be announced Tuesday and you'll be able to have the whole schedule. Okay, for, for coaching shows. So, yes? Is the exhibition game at UK going to be down at Memorial College now? Well, that's not an exhibition this year. Oh, it's not? Uh, no, we are, um, we actually are opening our season at Kentucky. So it's a for real, for real weekend. Oh, okay. Um, our exhibition will be, we'll play an exhibition next Saturday here. Um, boy, you put me in a tight spot there. Because it's not really, we have uh, Bellarmine University coming in next Saturday, oh, okay. and it's not going to be it's not going to be like a the Kentucky exhibition where the doors are open and there's people taking like it's not going to be that. It's going to be very informal, almost like today. We're just going to Bellarmine's coach and I are really good friends, and they're going to come in and we're just going to compete against each other next Saturday. I don't think we'll run anybody off if they come to watch, but we certainly aren't marketing it as an event. If that makes sense, you, you understand? I don't even know that we've decided. I think it's going to be, no, we, you'll, be, you'll be allowed to come watch, but again, it's not going to be, it may look like that. It's not the frills, right, right, right. It's not, a, it's not that. I think we're going to do it at noon, I think is when we decided to do it. Do you hear how confident that sounds? I'm not even sure what day it is. Much less, I mean, today, I'm not sure what day it is. So I, I, I know that's next Saturday. Um, but we, so we do, we're going to do an exhibition here next Saturday with Bellarmine and uh, more of an informal setting like what you saw out there today. Um, and then we open the following week and it begins our regular season schedule. We end at Memorial, we're starting at Memorial Coliseum in Kentucky. We're playing, it's an all, they did a, a multi-million dollar renovation to Memorial Coliseum. It's going to be beautiful. And they wanted to open it with uh, a tournament that featured all teams from the state. And so it's Moorhead State, Northern Kentucky, Western Kentucky, and Kentucky. And so we will play three matches up there and uh, finish that tournament with Kentucky, who will probably be in the top 10 in the, in the country in the preseason poll, which will come out next week. So that's where we're starting. Yes? Kind of a couple questions. The way you answer the first one kind of dictate the second one. Okay. <laughs> So I noticed serve receive, you were split in the backcourt. Mm -hmm. What causes you to want to do that? Mm -hmm. And I guess the second question is, center outside middle as usual, how are you running it? Are you still staying center outside middle or are you kind of fluctuating? Okay, let's talk about the serve receive question first. And what you're asking, I think, is we, just, we would have two people back there split in the court. 
that's a really good question, a really good topic, and it's um, one thing you'll learn about me if you haven't already is okay. My my beginnings in this sport were very really different than most. I didn't you know, like I'm I at the age it, like it's fascinating, but when I came to college, I had never played volleyball in my life. And so I am a self-made kind of, I always call myself a common sense coach. And so I don't do everything like every other team in the country does everything. And I kind of like it. I have, it has to run through my filter. It has to make sense to me. What we do here offensively, we set a higher ball to our middle attacks than most anybody in the country. And for the longest time, everybody around the country thought we were nutty for doing it until we finished in the top 10 in the country and hitting efficiency every year. And now you start to see more and more people doing it, you know? And uh, serve receive is a good example. So when we're receiving serve back there, okay, almost everybody you see in this game will have three passers back there. Almost everybody, okay? Um, in serve receive to receive the other team's serve, okay? We, typically have two, okay? Sometimes we'll draw the third person in there, but the question is why? Why do we only have two? There's two reasons why we only have two, okay? One is if you're gonna put a third person back in service seat, and this may be a little bit too much, you're, you're gonna be spending. I'm okay. So just, <laughs> just smile and not like you really know, but your head's probably gonna be spending. But most teams that put a third person in the pattern like we have three front row players and three back row players, okay? So if I'm gonna put, a lot of times this third back row player may be your setter who you're getting up here to the net to get ready to set. So if you're gonna add a third passer, you have to drop someone from the front row. And that puts a lot of pressure on them. Most every team will drop this left side person here to pass, and then they just swing out and hit, okay? Um, when we pass two, one of the benefits that that gives us is, well, when people drop that front row person back there, you know what happens? That person ends up having to pass 80% of the balls because they know if they can drive that person back here in this corner, it makes them have a long way to go to get to the ball, okay? Well, since we never drop that third person in there, and you might see us do it some with Kaylee Cox, she's quite capable of it. Okay, but all of our front row players are tucked up here in the front row, so there's nothing you can do to us serving that's going to impact what we want to do offensively. So that's one of the reasons that I like it. And number two, this is what I found, that this all spawned for me 25 years ago. We had a team that had two really good passers, but our third one, there was a real drop to our third passer. Okay, and so we passed three like everybody else in the country back then. Okay, and we had two good passers, and then we'll give this one a T. We'll call that Travis, because I'm a horrible passer. <laughs> okay, all right, so if you see those three back there in service to you, who's everybody going to serve every ball to? Travis. Good old Travis. Okay, so now even though my team has two really good passers, they're never passing any balls. Okay, and so every ball went to good old Travis, and so all of a sudden we weren't a very good passing team. Okay, so what I said was, you know what? Let's get Travis out of there, all right? And let's just split the court with two. Now, what's the downside to that? Well, the downside is they got a lot more court to come. But in my mind, if we do a good job training, footwork, balance, all those kinds of things, then they're going to be two really good passers are going to do a good job of covering that court. Are there times when somebody puts the ball right on the sideline and they get beat? Yes. But you know what? Him serving the ball right on that sideline and us getting beat happens a whole lot less than putting the big trap out there and serving receiver and just lobbing ball after ball after ball to him. And so we decided we were going to learn to pass two. Now to do it, what I can tell you our players have, and it's kind of fun to watch if you will, compare us to the team across the net when you watch passing, okay? Because we train balance and footwork like crazy every single day. Abby Schaefer is going into her junior year, she still does it every single day. Because any sport you play, balance is the key to consistency. You can make an off-balance jump shot, 
Yes, you can make one, but you're not going to make nearly as many as you make when you're in rhythm and on balance. So you can stab it all and serve receive and get it to go, to, but it's not going to happen. So, so we work really hard on the footwork part. If you watch our players when it's all served, you'll see our players moving with small, quick steps and almost always be on balance unless it's a terrific serve. And then they have to go to the ground and play. Other teams you'll see very rarely really move their feet much, and they're just kind of reaching and stabbing and, you know, doing those things. And, you know, uh, Karch Karai, our, our, our uh, Olympic team coach, and I have talked about this many times, okay? And uh, I train footwork in our gym every day. Karch Karai trains footwork in his gym never. And I'm like, okay, Karch, but there's a difference. Okay, I've got a five foot six kid here and a five foot six kid here. Okay, you've got world class six foot four, six foot four, six foot four. They don't have to move their feet. They can just stand and build platforms and almost touch each other with three players. Do you understand? So, so we work really, really hard on the on the, the footwork part of it uh, in order to be able to pass two. If a team is super aggressive or we're really struggling. You'll see us drop a third person in there occasionally just to give them a little bit of a help uh, in service. So, what else? Good question. All right, Tim, let's so, go. When the server's serving, they look over to you. What do you tell them? That's a good question. Okay, some of you guys know this. Everybody loves it when they understand it, and it is a great question for volleyball 101 because this really adds to your enjoyment watching the game. Okay, because they're going to be fighting for a seat where they can see what the coach is doing. Okay, so the court, they're giving you a, a location where they want you to serve the ball. All right, so a coach, Craig Perry, does it for us right now. Okay, and you'll see coaches hold, hold up and they'll give a number one, two, three, four, five, or six. Okay, and the court is split up into six zones. Okay, don't pay attention to the white line, look at the black line, okay? All right, this is on one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, why is it in the, I have no idea. <laughs> it seems kind of stupid to me. I would have started right there with one. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. But somebody smarter than me decided this was the way it needed to be, okay? And so, you know, we talked about them having three passers out here. Okay, and if this is Big Trap over here again in service seat, then Craig is going to look over and see where I am, and he's going to look at our server and say, hey, I want you to serve zone one. And then Abby is going to go back and try to put balls on that player in zone one. Okay, so it's just telling them where to try, try to locate the ball. Because sometimes you'll see zone one and they'll serve ball way over there. They're not perfect at it, but that's what those numbers are. And then there's more manipulations off of that that we utilize some. Uh, we're doing different things like trying to drive balls a little deeper or drop them in front of them and things like that. But as a general rule, it's those six zones. One, two, three, four, five, six. So in a game, if you sit somewhere where you can see the coach, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to see them go zone five and then you know where that serve's supposed to go and you can watch and see how they respond and react and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a really fun part of the game to be able to uh, to be a part of. So not knowing much about volleyball as the rest of them. So sometimes I see them serve, it's a knuckleball, mm -hmm. sometimes it's a top spin. Mm -hmm. Do you tell them that spin or they do that on their own? We pra no, we, pra we, we tell them that in the practice gym. Like some people, it's kind of like a fastball or a curveball or a knuckleball, okay? Um, almost everybody you see will serve a ball that it's called a floater serve, okay? And it's a ball where when you serve it, you're trying to punch the heel of your hand right through the center of the ball with no flex in your wrist at all. You want that ball to compress that ball and that ball comes off and it's like a novel ball in baseball. It comes at you and it, without any spin on it, the wind resistance against it makes that thing just start moving all over the place. And that is a the most effective serve in the game, okay? Occasionally you'll have a player that has a really good top spin serve where they'll go back and they'll be able to hit that thing and get it to dive in the court. For a top spin serve to be effective, they gotta be able to hit it hard, 
okay? Because the slow top spin serve has true spin on it, and you know it's that there's no none of this. So you're looking for that ball to be contacted clean. I get frustrated sometimes when we're trying to serve floater serves, and you'll see a little bit of spin on the ball because that little bit of spin reduces almost all the movement off the ball. And so, you know, you're looking to punch your heel of your hand through the center of that ball. You'll also see people serve floater serves standing on the ground. You'll see some that jump and do it. The, the jump float has become the serve in our game, the fancy serve these days. And the premise behind it is the higher I contact it, the flatter I can serve it at you, the which means the harder I can serve it and still get it in the court. It's just geometry, I think. Is that right, Mom? Geometry? <laughs> geometry. What else? Those are your questions. Yes. Talk about serving. Uh, can you kind of explain what would be acceptable serve percentage depending on maybe your opponent? Sir, <laughs> and when you say percentage, you mean misses? Uh, well, e either way you want to accept uh, <laughs> serving. The reason I laugh is because <laughs> there is nothing I get in trouble with more from, co from fans than like coach. Why do you guys miss so many serves? Okay, and this is an important part of understanding our game. This too will keep you from being nutty on game day. Okay, because you have to understand how our game flows. Okay, and if you, if you will watch, when a setter is setting a ball from a perfect spot where they want to be right there, that team's going to score at an incredibly high percentage of time. Okay, because when the ball's there, we got three blockers over here. Okay, this is good. This is another good volleyball one-on-one -on -one thing. Okay, and if we if we just lob our serve in and let them pass it perfectly to the setter right there, then you watch Callie out there. You have no idea where she's going to set. She may flip it behind her head. She may throw it out to the pin, or she may flip it up quick to the kid in the middle. And when they do that, all three of these blockers are really off balance. And at very best, it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one block. Okay? So advantage offense in a huge way. Okay? So the goal from the service line, obviously the goal is an ace, but at high-level volleyball, you're going to get a ton of aces. Aces are like bonus points. Aces are like aces in a high-level tennis match. Like, you get one every once in a while, but really what you're trying to do is just get an easier return for those of you that know tennis, right? So the goal from the service line for our team, if you want to know what the goal is, our goal is to serve a ball that is tough enough for them to pass on that side of this three meter line. If the setter is back here, you're like, you may be like, well, why does that matter? Because if the setter is back here, very rarely will they ever set this middle and so since I know that this middle's not here, when the ball's past there, you'll see our middle hitters start coming out here. And now all of a sudden we got a double block up against this hitter. And now we got a better chance to touch that ball, get a stop, do all those kinds of things. Does that make sense to you? So it is critical to get them playing their offense from off the net. Because if they're on the net, we I promise you, I promise you, if we just, I call it blowing balls. Okay, if they just kind of serve it, it just kind of floats over the net like a bubble. I promise you, if we let the other team pass perfect the whole game, we will lose 100 times out of 100. I promise you. They will shove it down our throat. Okay, and so it's a risk reward thing from the service line. So I've got to be risky. I've got to go after it aggressively. Okay, so I can try to get them to be running their offense from here because if they're running their offense from here, they're setting the majority of those balls out here and now our middles are releasing over here and we got a big double block in front of it. Okay, and the ball's coming from such a tough angle that a lot of times it's gonna be a tip or a shot or something like that that's much easier to defend. And now we can score points, okay? So what am I comfortable with, okay? Honestly, I'm comfortable, if you look at an ace to error ratio, okay, I will take a player that gets two aces for every three misses, okay? Two aces, so if you see our team with 10 aces and 15 errors, we'll probably win, okay? We'll probably win, okay? Because 
outside of those aces, if we're serving that top where we get 10 aces, they're going to be playing from back there a bunch, and we'll have a ton of scoring opportunities. So you must be aggressive from the service line. Now, what might confuse you is sometimes you see a, a, somebody blow a bubble over the net and still miss. That's pretty frustrating for me, too. I promise you they were never supposed to serve a bubble over the net, and then if you do, you better not miss it, that's for sure. Okay? But there's, you know, there's a lot of and we do a serve, it's all about being disruptive, okay? We have a serve, you'll see us drive serves deep, and you may have seen some of them, and then you'll see a serve that's kind of coming on the line, and then it gets to about there, and the bottom just falls out of it. That is something we train in our gym, okay? To work to be able to drive them deep, because that gets you dri driven deep, and you're standing up, passing, standing up, passing, and then you think here comes another one, and you get dug in, and that thing bottoms out right in front of you. It's difficult to be able to control the ball that much, okay? But when you do, at best, they're going to lunge forward and pop that ball straight up in the air right there, and you're going to have a chance to score points, okay? So it is, it is a frustrating part for fans. I know it is. It's frustrating for coaches sometimes, but it is, I, I'm telling you, it is absolutely critical to be. If you look at the men's game, Okay, and the men's game is almost unwatchable to me sometimes because they're throwing it up, and I mean swinging as hard as they can because they know if the other team passes it, the point's over. If they pass it, they're just going to crush it somewhere and the point's over. So their only chance is to rip an ace or somehow eat them up to where they have to send them a free ball. And our game is not that bad, thank goodness, but it is still an important part to be serving aggressive. It's a critical, critical part of the game to be able to serve aggressive. Yes? 